Always great to be joined by Albert Wynn. You know him better as the analytics capper himself. And Albert, always a pleasure, my friend. Thank you. Greg, thank you for having me on the show. I love this doing every Sunday night with you. Uh, there's so much to talk about, but I think we're going to dive into the beautiful NFL slate that was today. Oh, absolutely. And what did you make out of it? Because I feel like if you're on the right side of these beats, it was just as glorious as glorious gets. And I'm sure that there are other people if you took, oh, I don't know, the Ravens, the Seattle Seahawks, you're able to go down the line that it was a pretty tough day. So depending upon how it broke for you, this is either one where you're feeling super, super high or super, super low. And I always think that it's very important to keep things in the middle, no matter how good or bad your Sunday went. 100% there. Definitely never get too high or too low. With that being said, Greg, I was 7-0 heading into Sunday Night Football at the Packers plus 6.5. So I feel like that bad beat kind of covered some of those lucky wins uh, earlier during the day. But for me personally, it was awesome. Yep, it always is awesome to take a look at it. Just in terms of that Sunday Night game, how about if we start right there? Because with the Packers, they have Aaron Rodgers leave the game. But I actually really liked what I saw to Jordan Love. And if Jordan Love goes out there next week against the Chicago Bears, I wouldn't feel too bad about backing them. I'm not sure where you stand here because, I mean, that game is just all out of sorts. Who knows if we get Justin Fields back? Who knows if Aaron Rodgers is going to be out there or not? This is just completely unbettable at this point. But if more information comes out and you get something like Jordan Love against Trevor Simeon, I wouldn't feel too bad about backing the Packers. Yeah, I mean, with the Packers sitting at 4-8, Greg, I, if, I, if, if I was running the Packers today, I would have Jordan Love start the rest of the season, to be honest. Uh, like you said, he did not look bad at all. He was, ended the game 6 for 9, 113 yards, one touchdown. Uh, the full quarter that he played in the fourth, he did beat the Eagles 10-6 there. So, I mean, he looked great. And honestly, Aaron Rodgers was nursing that thumb all week long. So, I'm, I'm sure Jordan Love got a lot of first-team reps during practice all week. So, I, I think he looked great. I think he needs to use his legs. Again, Is a very, very small sample size. We just watched about a quarter and a half of him play. Um, but as far as moving forward, the Packers as an organization needs to see what they have in Jordan Love. And sitting at 4-8 and eight, the next five games is actually perfect, perfect opportunity for them to do so. Yep, I agree with you. I do think that it is very important to know sort of what you've got. I know that Aaron Rodgers probably not going to want to hear that, but I do think that it is important just for the Packers as a whole to be able to just identify perhaps just a little bit of something there. And then when it comes to the other quarterback that was thrown in the fray, we're we're not going to bring up Trevor Simeon. Let's call it what it is. He is not the future of the Chicago Bears. That would be Justin Fields and would not be surprised if Justin Fields is back out there within the next few weeks. I think that they're going to want to give him some more reps. But with that said, Mike White, he was looking like Mr. Right for the for the New York Jets this week, he goes 22 of 28, 300 plus yards, pair of touchdowns. I really liked what I saw out of him. And I think that it's interesting to handicap the Jets now because with the Jets, I just feel like literally they needed anyone else out there other than Zach Wilson. With his post-game comments, typically I don't make a lot out of off-the-field things when it comes to my handicapping, but he completely lost the team. They were not going to fight for him whatsoever. You could tell that they were just having a little bit more pep in their step when it came to having Mike White out there. And I think that this is big for the Jets moving forward because they've got the pieces around White to be successful. They just need him to pretty much not screw things up. I fully agree with you, Greg. I would say one caveat, though. They did play the Chicago Bears today, one of the worst defenses in the league. They didn't really have a quarterback situation until 10 minutes before kickoff. So uh, there were a lot of things working for Mike White. With that being said... 22 of 28, 315 yards, three touchdowns, zero interceptions. The Jets covered easily 31 to 10. They could have beaten the Bears even even by more than that. He looks great. It looks it seems like he should have been starting the entire time this season to be honest. I think a lot of that is the political side of, you know, so much draft equity and so much draft capital used on Zach Wilson that they had to see what he was made out of. And honestly, I just don't think that um, you know, Zach Wilson is a type of leader. Maybe he can become and grow into one, but he's still young. He's still a kid. He's still immature. Mike White's been around a, a couple years longer. So I, I do think Mike White is, uh, would give the Jets the best chance to win moving forward because this is a playoff ready defense. Yep. I agree with you. I do think that Mike White is right now the guy for the Jets. 
And with Zach Wilson, I just frankly have not liked what I've seen out of him on the field, off the field. You're able to go down the list. He just has not demonstrated what you want for an NFL quarterback in regards to his play for sure. So we shall see what his future is going to be moving forward. And we shall see what the future is going to be moving forward out of the Jaguars as you had a very nice comeback win from Trevor Lawrence. Just more for me. Maybe I'm just a little bit jaded because I was on the Ravens. So another blown lead from them. This is the fourth time this year in which they have blown at least a nine-point lead in the second half to lose a game. We saw it happen once again here. I think a lot of credit needs to be given to Trevor Lawrence for being able to convert that third and 21, be able to get the team to move the chains, and then ultimately win the game. But also with the Ravens, it's becoming a little bit of a theme with them. Yeah, it has been becoming a little bit of a theme this season, 2022. With that being said, it seemed like they were getting back on the right foot especially defensively. Uh, this was a, definitely a step back here. Trevor Lawrence ended the game 29 for 37, over 300 yards, three touchdowns, zero interceptions. This was a great game because they scored that you know late, late touchdown there and then went for two to get the win with Zay Jones, and they got it. So that was exciting for that franchise. They know they're not going to make the playoffs, so they're going to go you know balls to the wall here and trying to get a couple wins. The good thing for the Ravens, though, especially for that defense, they're hosting the Denver Broncos next Sunday. If you want to get right, if you want to get your defensive numbers back where it should be, just play the Denver Broncos and you should be good to go. Yeah, oh boy. Let's dive into that as well. I mean, with the Denver Broncos, this has got to be the biggest disappointment we've seen in the NFL in a long time. I remember when Vince Young came out and said that the Philadelphia Eagles were the dream team and the only dream that they had was making the playoffs because they were nowhere close to it. But I mean, I can't remember a deal working out much worse for a team because Geno Smith looks just as good, if not better than Russell Wilson ever was in Seattle. And right now for the Denver Broncos, they're just left holding the bag with $250 million. And they've got a guy, Nathaniel Hackett, that has no idea how to coach. Yeah, it's not only that contract, it's not only the head coach, but they gave up a lot for Russell Wilson from a draft equity standpoint as well. Uh, tons of draft picks, not, not only this year's draft, but next year's draft. So they're going to, uh, I guess, reap the the unbenefits here for a couple years here down the line. With that being said, though, I, I think there is still some juice left in Russell Wilson. It's tough situation, right? He's going into a brand new team, brand new coaching staff. Um, I'm not, I've never been a big Russell Wilson fan, but I think they're, when you have that high of a, a football IQ, and which I do think he does have, um, I think he's going to be able to figure it out. I just don't think physically he has a, the tools or the gifts that he used to be. There's really no burst anymore. There's no quickness. When he gets out of the pocket, he's not able to make people miss. And I think that's the reason why we see him struggling so much for the Broncos. We saw them blow up on the sidelines today. Hopefully they get some of that uh, firmed up and wrapped up heading into next week. Yep, it is not great to say the least. And in terms of a team that is the exact opposite, one that I was feeling lower on and now I'm feeling better and better about, it's the Commanders. I feel like this is a team that you sort of bet them until they lose sort of thing slash not cover because with Taylor Heineke, they just seem to respond to him differently. I was talking about this with the Jets, but I'm also noticing it with the Commanders. When you had Carson Wentz out there, they look completely disjointed. And with Heineke, is he great? No, but he's gotten these guys to respond and fire on all cylinders. Yeah, I love this theme that you're talking about, the quarterback and the rest of the team. I think once a team loses faith or loses confidence in a quarterback, you see it right away. It's not subtle. You see it on the game. You see their their faces, their body language, and how they speak about the team afterwards. But you're you're mentioning guys that, uh, you know, the teams really believe in. Like, they rather play for Heineke over Carson Wentz. They rather play uh, for Mike White over Zach Wilson, guys like that. So I agree with you. I'm very excited for this Commanders team. I didn't touch this game personally. I honestly, full disclosure, would have been on the other side if, if I had to bet the game. So I'm glad I didn't touch it. Washington looks like a great team, and the NFC East is, is beasting again. Yes, the NFC beast, it is back, and... Something that is back, Monday Night Football. We're going to get the thoughts next of Albert Wynn, better known as Analytics Capper, right here on the Greg Peterson Experience on VEASAN, the Sports Bank Network. We're back here on the Greg Peterson Experience on VEASAN, the Sports Bank Network. Always great to have Albert Wynn, the Analytics Capper, on with me. And Albert, let's dive into Monday Night Football. It is the Steelers. 
It is the Colts. The Steelers are currently a two and a half point underdog total on this game, and we're between 39 and 39 and a half. I had to take a side in terms of our Visa and bets giving. I took the Colts laying two and a half, mostly because I just cannot trust in Kenny Pickett. I wish I had more of a diverse handicap of like 50 different reasons, but <laughs> this is a game that pretty much I had to play. And I said, you know what? I want no part of my contest being on Kenny Pickett in this spot. Do you have any sort of a side or total that you're feeling a little bit more bullish about? Yeah, Greg, you talk about trust for the quarterbacks here. It's hard for me to trust either quarterback. Uh, Matt Ryan did yeah. um, play a lot better after his benching, right? Um, but he just, it's just hard for me to trust him, especially at home. With that being said, we are seeing two really bad offenses here. Pittsburgh's only averaging 17 points a game. Uh, the Colts are averaging a little over 15 and a half, two of the worst offenses in the league. The under seems really, really easy. Every bone, every fiber in my body is telling me not to take it, but I, I think I have to here, Greg. I, I don't believe in the offense here. So a very correlated bet here, not only the under 39 and a half, but I think they're going to ride both. Uh, running backs really, really hard. Jonathan Taylor as well as Najee Harris. So as a player prop, I like Najee Harris over 17 and a half rushing attempts. That's not yards because I don't know if he's, he's going to get enough yards. I don't know if he's going to get a touchdown, but I think they're going to milk him a lot. So over 17 and a half rushing attempts. And I think we're going to see a, a ton of three and outs all game long. So I think he's going to have a lot of opportunities. Yep, I'm right there with you. And that's one of the props that I was sort of taking a look at as well because for this Visa and Bets giving, I've got to take some sort of player prop. I'm thinking because I am currently right there with Gil Alexander, third place. I'm down a little bit over $100, and I think that I'm going to be opposite here of Dave Tooley. Dave Tooley, a very notorious underdog better. Watch, he's going to flip the script on me, and I'm going to feel like a complete <laughs> moron. But that said, I'm probably going to need to hit a little bit of a plus money prop here. And something that I dug up, over three and a half field goals for the entirety of the game at a plus 125. You think that this is worth a look because I just take a look at both of these teams and you just mentioned it. Both of these quarterbacks are relatively untrustworthy. What I find interesting is that the Steelers have not really gotten a lot of sacks. They're averaging fewer than two per game. A lot of that is without TJ Watt, but I think that there's going to be a lot of opportunities where these teams are stopped at like the 25, 30, 20 yard line, what have you, and they have to settle for field goals. Yeah, I do like that look, Greg. I mean, the total right now is 39 and a half. It's a really odd number. Uh, the game is playing indoors, so you don't have to worry about the weather when they're kicking field goals or, you know, wetness of the balls or wind, things like that. So I do like that look a lot. And you're right, two struggling offenses, which usually means two really bad quarterbacks in the red zone. So I do like that there's there's going to be a lot of field goal attempts or maybe they're going to go for a lot of fourth downs. We'll see. You'll 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 figure that out or you'll find that out really early in the game when we see our first fourth down situation. But I do like that over three and a half field goals. All right. That sounds good to me. That is one that I'm very much looking at. I will review what I actually go with in the final segment of the show. But that said, we've also got a very interesting primetime game, one that is going to be better than this one. That is going to be coming up for Thursday. How about if we have Bills versus Patriots right now with the Bills between five and five and a half point favorites, depending upon where you look and just such a fascinating spot because both of these teams, they played well last Thursday. They were playing on Thanksgiving. So both of these teams are not going to be at any sort of a rest disadvantage or anything like that. Jordan's game is anywhere between 44 and a half and 45 as well. And I think that this is a little bit correlated because with the New England Patriots, they've had a tough time scoring all season long. I think that an under proves very well for them, but I know that you're aware of this as well as I am. The Bills have actually been a very good under team this season. It hasn't necessarily rained as true the last few weeks with the way that they've been scoring a tad bit more, but I do think that it's an interesting spot, but I still do think that if you see a higher scoring game, it is going to bode a bit better for the Buffalo Bills. Yeah, you're right, Greg. Those numbers, uh, you know, add up. The Bills are eight and three overall, but they're only three and eight on the over. So it is. It's been an under team all season long. They only give up a little over 18 points. That's really impressive because they're usually blowing out teams, and they're still being. They're still able to hold them down. With that being said, the Patriots here. Last time we saw them was in Minnesota. Um, it it seemed like they were getting you know really bad whistles there. In my opinion. It was their first game in five games where they gained over 400 yards. So they had 409 yards against the Minnesota Vikings, who have a really good defense. Um, but a lot of that, you know, was 
was New England playing from behind. Before that, they were under 300 yards, four straight games. The Patriots offense have been struggling, especially with uh, Matt Jones at the helm. With that being said, though, I think I like the five and a half here, Greg. The last time we saw these two teams match up head to head was last season's NFL playoffs. And I think the Bills beat them 47-17. I think they're still scoring on the Patriots, to be <laughs> honest. And they're only five and a half point dogs uh, in this game. Again, Thursday, uh, a lot of things, weird things happening mid- middle of the week. Uh, Greg mentioned it. There's no rest advantage or disadvantage here. But the Bills are only one and four against the spread in the last five, while the Patriots are six and two. I'm going to ride that trend. I think Bill Belichick is good at covering. Yep. And what else I think is going to be very interesting to dive into another game for week 13 is what we're going to be seeing out of the LA Chargers because. We were mentioning it with this being a little bit of a earlier game, and we've seen some very interesting results in the AFC in general. The Chargers being able to pull off that win against the Cardinals and going for it on two and getting it, that's a big momentum booster, and they're going up against a Raiders team that they are also riding very, very high with their Sunday win. And over time, they go on the road, they get it done against the Seattle Seahawks. So I do think that it's an interesting dynamic with the Chargers going from being a three-point favorite on the look at line to a two-and-a-half-point favorite. Where do you stand on this game? Because I do think that it's just a spot in general that is very unique for both of these teams. They're coming in riding a bunch of momentum, but I do take a look at this Vegas Raiders team, and I still don't know if I'm willing to trust them because each other last two wins, they came in overtime, and they came in, shall we say, very strange circumstances. Yeah, if you're looking purely at the line, it does read like it's a Raiders play, to be honest. With that being said, though, the Chargers are still playing for something. The Raiders season is pretty much done. Uh, they could win now and still not make the playoffs. They're, I believe they're sitting at yeah four and seven, whereas the Chargers, with that two-point conversion against the Cardinals, are now six and five and still have a really good shot as at a uh, you know playoff wild card there in the AFC West. They average 23 points a game, give up 25 points. Uh, they're very, very similar when it comes to their points per game and defensive points per game given up. But the Chargers, I mentioned this on a previous show, they play really well away from L.A. They don't really have a home field advantage in L.A. Uh, at their new SoFi Stadium. But away from L.A., they are 5-1 and one against the spread on the road. So uh, it's going to be a tough one right now. I do lean the Raiders at you know with the line moving that way. Um, but right now, as far as motivation is concerned, it's all on the Chargers side. Absolutely. And then I know that there was one thing in terms of a player perspective that you were taking a look at as well. I think that you're pretty sure that the NFL's MVP award, it is signed, sealed, and delivered. Take me through it and how you feel like it's still, even at the current number, relatively good value. Yeah, I think the biggest um, the b- biggest reason why I like Patrick Mahomes to win the NFL MVP, and I've I've liked it for the last couple of weeks now. I was a big believer in Josh, Josh Allen. He got hurt, and you know, especially after uh, the Bills went into Kansas City and beat Kansas City, I thought it was going to be Josh Allen's award to lose. But Patrick Mahomes, if you look at his numbers, there's no one even close. Um, there's no one close in terms of yardage, uh, passing touchdowns. The lack of interceptions. Jalen Hurts has been having an unbelievable season, and he is number two on the MVP list. And the Eagles are 10 and 1. They're probably going to finish with the best record in the NFL, and he's still a 4 to 1, um, you know, odds when it comes to the MVP. So I think the market is telling you it's Patrick Mahomes, and it's only Patrick Mahomes unless he gets hurt. And I, I don't think he's going to get hurt. I, I think he, the Chiefs look like they're focused. They lost Tyreek Hill, uh, you know, in the offseason, and he's still having great numbers. So I do like Patrick Mahomes moving forward. If we're going to have a competition where you have to choose um, an MVP that's not Patrick Mahomes, whether it's Tua or Josh Allen or, um, you know, Jalen Hurts, I think it would be Jalen Hurts. But right now I'm going to say Patrick Mahomes is pretty much a, a done deal. What do you think? Yep, I do think so as well. Like you said, the only thing that can slow him down is injury, and that's just something that you really cannot handicap, but you do a great job handicapping a little bit of everything, Albert. Always appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greg. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving, you and your family there in Vegas, and uh, I'll be I'll be visiting you soon, so we got to meet up. Visit VEASAN.com to get current odds. Listen for free, find showtimes, and download VEASAN's sports betting podcasts.